Okay, so um, so yeah, just to introduce myself, I'm Sophie Clark. I am the lead on marketing for the UK and Nordics at Talkwalker. Um, and today I'm joined by James McGregor um, from Bacamo Public. He'll be presenting today. So he is the managing director of Bacamo Public, um, who are a strategic social listening consultancy. So he's worked in social research, public administration and public policy for 15 years in both London and Washington, DC. Um, and before Bacamo, he led on new business for Kantar Public UK. So definitely got a lot of experience there. Um, so today he's going to talk through um, a recent study that Bacamo conducted for Ofcom, um, who are the UK broadcasting regulator. So they used Talkwalker to explore what consumers of BBC News really thought about the broadcaster um, by analysing what they talked about and shared online. So are you using social listening or conversational intelligence? Um, so during the presentation, he's going to, uh, James is going to talk about how Bacamo have been using social listening. He's also going to talk about how the world is a dog and not a football. <laughs> so uh, interested to hear what that's about. Um, he's going to give a, an example of, of how this is used by the BBC case study and obviously we'll sum up at the end. <clears throat> So for those of you who don't know who Talkwalker is, um, we're actually a leader in conversational intelligence. So basically we're a, a listening and analytics company that empowers brands to optimize their digital strategies by understanding conversations at scale. So we're a global company um, with offices worldwide. We have over 350 employees, a third of whom are engineers and data scientists, um, and we're leaders in AI as well. Um, we specialize in our protect, measure and promote framework. Um, so on the next slide, um, you can see that we use this framework to help companies maximize their performance and minimize risk. Um, so in the protect area, we do this um, by helping with brand protection and reputation management, things like issue tracking and crisis management. In the, in the measure area, we um, help with performance measurement and reporting, um, things like social measurement, brand health measurement. And in the promote area, we put um, conversations in context to uncover brand insights. So um, brands and organizations use us for things like influencer management, content ideation, trend research, that sort of thing. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, I'll hand over to, to James at this point. Thank you, Sophie. Um, Thanks for the invitation to speak today as well. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be talking with this audience about these matters. Um, this is usually where I do the fire drill announcement, but I'm not sure that's appropriate anymore. Um, so I'm just going to move on and talk about the uh, talk through the agenda, which Sophie has introduced for us. I'm going to pause halfway through after I I'm, hope persuade you all that the dog uh, that the world is like a dog rather than a football. So just for any clarifications that come up immediately. Um, but because of the format, as Sophie's mentioned, um, please hang on to those discussion topics uh, towards the end of the presentation. We'll be leaving uh, lots of time, uh, around 20 minutes or so for question and conversation. So it's there that we can have the best conversation. But there's one more thing that I wanted to add to what Sophie's just said. And it refers to how Bacamo uses talk walkers industry leading capabilities. In a nutshell, what we do is to use all of these capabilities that Sophie's described and we add a layer of what we call understanding. So what that means um, for us and why we think our clients hire us, why our clients tell us they hire us, is when they see a chasm, a ravine between themselves and their customers or between themselves and their supporters, or for governments and values-based organisations between themselves and the general public or citizens. And we use Talk Walkers tools and our analytical and theoretical techniques to bridge the chasm for our clients. Now, before going on to talk through the example that Sophie mentioned at the outset, I want to use a couple of minutes to reflect on what we do at Bacamo and what bridging the chasm actually means. So at Bacamo, we, talk, we use TalkWalkers tools 
uh, and that allows us to take a fundamentally different perspective on insight compared with traditional research approaches, traditional research approaches that I've been using for 15 years in, in my career, as Sophie touched on. Because we can use TalkWalk as tools, we can take what is literally a census of any given online conversation, uh, harvest that conversation and all the associated dialogue and retain the full complexity of that conversation without reducing it. And when I say, when I say the full complexity, I mean, uh, for example, the chronology of the conversation. So how's that developed over time? The evolution of the conversation, how's it changed? The communities within which conversation takes place, whether that be online communities, offline communities, or indeed increasingly both, and particularly at the moment, both. Uh, I mean retention of the linkages between people involved in discourse and of course the wider context in which discourse takes place. So we're capturing the full complexity without reducing it. But why do that? I mean it's a lot of data. There's no face-to-face -face contact which is often something which is held up as particularly desirable in traditional research methods. And so why don't our clients just use traditional methods like focus groups or surveys instead? Well there are lots of reasons, but we think the core reason is because we're applying um, uh, something called systems theory, developed by um, uh, an academic, Nicholas Luhmann, here in the middle, in the second half of the 20th century. At the root, systems theory, a systems theory lens, allows us to interpret people's online behaviours and discern their motivations and needs, even when they themselves aren't necessarily consciously aware of their motivations and needs. The idea is, in systems theory, is that meaning is contingent, or to put it another way, meaning emerges from social systems. Meaning is socially constructed. It doesn't exist in and of itself. It's only constructed by the complex interactions of people. And it's from there that meaning emerges. In that sense, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So it follows, therefore, that if you want to understand any given subject, particularly complex subjects and subjects where you don't really you don't have any particularly strong hypotheses, the only way to derive understanding is to explore and examine the area in all of its glorious complexity and it's within its social context. Traditional methods will often do the opposite of that. They will tend to, by design, they are intended to simplify to isolate phenomena, to predefine. So, for example, if you're running focus groups, you simplify by asking questions because you bound the discourse by the questions that you ask and the language that you use. You isolate particular groups by sampling particular people and you predefine thereby what people are going to say by how you approach asking them to say things. Now, I'm not in any sense suggesting that's not a valid approach. It absolutely is, and I've, as I've mentioned, I've used this throughout my 15 years of my 15 year career, but it doesn't work in every circumstance. And it particularly can be quite limiting when we're looking at big, complex questions where we don't really know what people are going to say. So to try and pin that down into the real world, we therefore see the world more like a dog than like a football. So what I mean by that is, Traditional methods will see the world more like a football. If you kick it, you can predict, to some degree at least, where it's going to go. And it's probably going to go somewhere near where you intend it to go. It's not going to do anything else. Before you kicked it, you knew that was going to happen. And you know that if you do the same thing again, to the same ball in the same place, it's going to be a similar outcome. It's predictable and causation is linear. And that's very attractive. But unfortunately, as we all know, instinctively and through our own experiences, the world's not that simple. Social listening, as we do it, views the world more like a dog. Excuse the rather unpleasant image, but if you kick a dog, you've got no idea what's going to happen. And I would suggest it's probably not a very wise thing to do for that reason. And if you kick that dog again, at the same time, in the same place, in the same circumstances, you have no idea if the if the dog's gonna react in the same way that it did before, or whether it's gonna do something completely different. So we see the world as being more like the dog 
It's unpredictable, it's complex, it is itself a system. And each person is a system. Each person is complex. So only really by accepting and embracing that complexity can we really start to understand how people are going to react or how people serve their needs. So I'm sure we can maybe in, in conversation come back to the question of the, uh, the football and the dog. But I want to move on and talk about the practicality of what does seeing the world as a complex system actually entail? Well, for us, as I hope the image illustrates, it means listening to lots and lots and lots of people. What we do at Bakamo is we listen to entire conversations over time and in the full range of social channels that Talkwalker gives us access to. We don't ask anybody any questions at any point. So we're not biasing our assumptions in our research design by presuming that people are going to talk about the things that we want them or, more importantly, expect them to talk about. We're not using sample frames to reduce down our populations or any analytical frameworks that we create throughout the process. What we're doing is by listening only, we're taking data that's in the public domain and hence is usable according to the law. And we're processing all of that data with all of that complexity into meaning. And we call this our insight without asking approach. Now, I just evangelized for a couple of minutes about what we do. And I hope my excitement about it comes across, but I'm not trying to project that social listening answers everything. And I'm not trying to project that social listening has no limitations. Of course it does. So for example, it's limited in terms of its sampling control. People are anonymous to a large degree online and therefore sampling online isn't easy meaning targeting particular people to hear from, from is a difficult thing to do. And also opportunities for statistical analysis, so significance testing and so on, are very limited. It's a, it's a qualitative method. So it's not appropriate for everything. And it does have limitations. But from our point of view, it also has benefits because you can listen using Talkwalker's tools to every person engaged in any given online conversation. So you can really do work at scale. So to bring it back to the big thinkers of the 20th century, we think this quote from Gardamer, who was a philosopher of interpretation, um, sums up our position quite well. Understanding does not occur when we try to intercept this, what someone wants to say to us by claiming we already know it. So at times, and in, at times unhelpfully, traditional research techniques make some assumptions that we already know what people are going to say. And that's how, and that's the phenomenon that we get past by social listening. So what we are able to demonstrate is that our approach can build new bridges of relevance between an organization and the people whom it wishes to engage with or influence. Even if we don't know at the outset of the project exactly where that bridge is gonna land, we can still bridge that chasm. So specifically, how does it work? And conceptually, it's, it's, it's straightforward. We're in, we, we, we take a three-pronged approach in all of our projects, three steps. First, we use Talkwalker's tools, advanced technologies, to listen to the world without asking people questions. Then secondly, when we've harvested the data we want to harvest, we get our human analysts, and we have a large network and team of human analysts, experienced human analysts, to interpret the authentic conversations of other human beings. And that's rooted in the idea that only humans can understand other humans, and it's only human interpretation that can really build deep understanding. Um, and at times we'll extend the capacity of our human analysts using um, things like machine learning and artificial intelligence, but at, but at all times, it's the human at the center of the analytical process, not algorithms. And then thirdly, we do a, some one pot, pot cooking at the end. So we've taken our harvest of our data, we've applied analysis and we report. And it's my experience in reading all of our reports that we are able to create inside that answers big questions. And we're able to make strategic, rec strategic recommendations. And often those recommendations are unexpected because using our social listening approach, because we're not asking questions, we're able to see over the horizon of expected answers and really get to what's actually going on. 
So I'm going to pause there before going on and giving the example that Sophie mentioned at the outset to see if there are any urgent questions or clarifications that we should address at this point. And Sophie, I don't know if there are any questions that have come in on the chat that we should talk about here. Oh, um, oh there's one that's just come in um, from Heather, who asks, how do you avoid bias? That's such an important and fundamental question. Um, it's a qualitative method, social listening. So the avoidance of bias in any kind of direct sense will never be possible. And I would argue, actually, all research to some degree has qualitative components because the people involved in designing and doing that research are making judgments on things and they're making judgments on things according to their own views of the world and naturally we are all biased in many many different directions so avoiding bias directly i don't think is ever going to be possible in in, in research what we do do is we incorporate all of those techniques of uh, that you would expect in qualitative research to cross-reference people's findings, to uh, make sure that findings are kind of socialised within the team so that we're checking each other's work, so we have more than one analyst working on data so that it, we're not just reliant on one person's interpretation but the group is making an interpretation. We discuss findings as we go through and we challenge each other. And as a result of that, we're able to get to um, what we think are unbiased views, not because we're not biased people, but because we're looking to control for bias throughout as we do the project. Great. We've got one other question as well um, from Richard, who asks, what languages do you focus on? Um, just from a talk walker perspective, I can answer talk walker can analyze, I think it's 187 languages, but I guess, um, James, maybe you can talk more about yeah, kind of how you do it, use it. We have, as of yet, not worked in 187 languages, um, but we also haven't found a language that we can't work in. So up to this point, we've worked across um, more than 50 countries, and we've worked in more than 50 languages. And as I say, we're yet to come across a language which we can't work in because we have a network of analysts around the world who are native speakers and imbued in the context and we've always been able to find additional native language speakers to work with us when we need to break new ground the, the only the only thing that's worth mentioning about coverage it's not about language actually but it's about accessibility to data some countries have restrictions on accessibility to data which can at times curtail the ability to analyze and extract those data um, but that's that's rare in countries in the world and it's probably is, is more of a limitation than languages so in essence we we are confident that we can work in any language we also we have another question from heather to follow up on the bias question you might end up answering this later in the presentation i'm not sure but um she asks aren't the social conversations themselves biased the people who make the most noise often have the most extreme views Yes, absolutely, indeed. And we will come on to exactly that point, Sophie, as you predict. Yes, people are biased, of course. Um, and actually, we want that bias, because often what we are trying to answer for clients is a version of the question, how are people biased in what directions and what ways? Um, so, uh, yes, we are dealing with biased people. I think it goes back to my early point. We're, we're all biased in lots and lots of different ways. Um, and, and often what our clients want to understand is what does that bias mean for them? Um, in terms of bias, so that another way that one might bias is in sampling. So I think this, and of course sampling is in traditional sampling in, in, in research is intended to kind of, to some degree, eliminate biases by taking a sample of the entire population. What we're doing with social listening using TalkWalker's tools it enables us to do is to take a census of the entire conversation. So I'm going to talk about BBC News online in uh, over about 15 minutes in, in a minute or so. And, and what we did in that was to harvest globally every conversation um, which referenced BBC News. So in that sense, we're not sampling from a population. We are observing the entirety of the population. So that kind of takes out that sampling bias, which you often get. 
Great. I don't think there's any more questions for now. So um, yeah, we can probably move on to the to the case study. Great. So as Sophie, as you mentioned, we did a study, uh, completed this a few months ago um, for a client of ours, uh, Ofcom. And for those not aware, uh, Ofcom has a, a statutory legal regulatory role um, overseeing the BBC, which it acquired in 2017. So they've been doing, and this is all on their website, so like the trainer conferences, they've been doing a large um, study uh, aligned with their role as regulator of the BBC, a component of which was this social media intelligence study. Now, this is um, available. The, uh, what, what I'm going to share on the call today, these findings are all in the public domain, and Ofcom has actually published the full report and the summary report on their website, and, and we'll, we'll direct you to that subsequent to the call. Um, so all of this is information is in the public domain already, and we won't cover everything in the next 20 minutes, um, but hopefully we can get a flavour and exemplify what this approach to social listening can achieve. Um, so what did Ofcom understand? Well, they had a big, broad question that they came to us with, and it was to understand the dissemination of BBC News links in the social media space. And within that question, they wanted to understand three things. One, the volume of sharing of BBC News. So a quantification of sharing, because we're taking a census, we can do that. Secondly, they, want us, they wanted to understand the size of sharing networks relating to particular stories. And thirdly, and I think most challengingly, they wanted to understand discussions surrounding news stories and derive from that understanding of dissemination about BBC News. So a big central question seeking narrative, a set of questions seeking narrative understanding where we have a limited number of hypotheses where this phenom these phenomena are happening in a complex world in real time and at massive global scale. A perfect set of questions for Talk Walker's tools and, and Bacamo's abilities. So we were delighted to take it on. Before coming on to findings, let me explain a little about how we went about this methodologically. So we used two different talk walker search methods to capture data. One was keywords on the left and the other was URL links on the right and our competitor set, the study was formed around defined by the client, is in the middle. So firstly on the keyword query we used um, semantic queries, word searching as we all would recognize it, to search for the term BBC News to find conversations specifically about BBC News's delivery. But for those people who are sharing BBC News links or talking about BBC News, they're not necessarily going to be directly using the phrase or associated phrases. So we also used URL link queries where we collected uh, posts that were shared that included a link from one of the target providers in the middle um, or to a BBC News article. So we use two different ways of harvesting data. And then we use those data as the basis for four stages of work. Firstly, looking at volumes, then looking at topics that people talk about. So uh, volumes quite descriptive, topics looking at deriving what are the things that people are talking about beyond the, the kind of, you know, the, the structure of BBC News, so beyond education or health or politics, or, you know, what, what are the topics that people are talking about beyond that? Then we did some profiling work to actually segment these audiences, again, as a census of everybody online. And then we did further work to build understanding of perception within each of those segments. I'm gonna take those in turn to try and give you a flavor of what we can achieve with these kinds of social listening approaches. So firstly, volumes. So this is what we did on volumes. There was a quantitative analysis of the volume or number more accurately of news links shared and news provider mentions. So the query approach was the keyword approach and the URL link approach from Talkwalker. The scope was global, so it was the whole world. And it was all the news providers that, that um, I put in a list as a competitor set before. So it's, it's everything. Um, we use Talkwalker's tools to get data on volume, reach and engagement. And we also separately, but alongside, did our own manual coding of social media following. So we went in and looked at who's following whom and who's following what. We added that to our data set. 
Um, we also did some work using Talkwalkers tools again to divide up according to users' geolocations, their media platforms and their gender. So we're able to inject some profiling, some quite basic profiling of sharers into this data set by kind of adding together different uh, information which indicates the profile of any given individual. And then we looked around conversation spikes. So when conversation really amplified to identify top trending articles, breaches and news providers and using those things as hooks to get into volumetric mapping. So here's just one headline from the finding of volumes. Engagement on social media with BBC News Online far exceeded any other news providers which are comparable to BBC News. Um, where the BBC got pretty much about double the likes, shares and comments than its nearest UK based competitor, The Guardian. So um, I should point out Lad's Bible there, third from the bottom. Actually, their engagement per post is really, really high, although they're a relatively small volume provider, comparably speaking, compared to the BBC. So the BBC isn't kind of blowing everybody out of the water on engagement, if you accept that engagement is a positive phenomenon. I think the BBC would argue that. Um, but when it comes to mainstream providers, engagement with BBC content, content far exceeds what I think it would be fair to describe as their direct competitors. So interesting, helpful direction. But that in itself isn't enough. So secondly, we also wanted to understand topics. So we engaged in some analysis of the types of BBC News categories that people shared. And again, the way that we did it was to use both the query, uh, excuse me, use both the keyword and the URL, uh, URL linking methods from Talkwalker. We looked across the entirety of the world and we harvested data from all of the news providers. So again, we're casting that over everything. And then we took the 25 most engaging articles in each of the news categories that we collected from Talkwalker as the basis for qualitative thematic analysis. Now, what I mean by qualitative thematic analysis, very simply, is our human analysis, human analysts, sitting down with data and deciding which category each comment goes into which topic category each comment goes into. So it's a, it's a human exercise. Now I should say when we're using data at these scales, we, we will sometimes get our human analysts to or equip our human analysts with um, some algorithms, some artificial intelligence and some machine learning so that we expand their capacity. So they're able to get through more data in any given time period than they would otherwise be able to do. Um, but even when we do do that, we are at all times putting human judgment at the center because we strongly believe that only humans are able to interpret other humans' behaviors, intentions, and needs, and so on. So what did we find? The team was somewhat surprised by this, actually. And I must say, it's a rather counterintuitive finding. We found that world news and science attracted the highest levels of engagement, with higher volumes of likes and comments attributed to these kinds of articles. Now, the reason I say that this, to me at least, is a rather counterintuitive finding is that we were doing this at the time when I think it's fair to say UK politics was dominated by conversations about Brexit. So I think our supposition was going into this that we would likely see high levels engagement for things which are about Brexit. Actually, we didn't see that at all. We saw much higher levels of engagement for the two things that I said. The science engagement example was largely that that degree, that very high number for science, 1750, was largely the product of one story. Um, I imagine most of us will remember this story, but it was when the BBC published uh, the first image of a black hole. And actually this was across a whole range of news providers, it certainly wasn't just the BBC. If it hadn't been for that black hole image and associated story, um, it would have been the world news category that would have led by engagement rather than science. Um, yeah, so as I say, it wasn't what we might consider the controversial domestic political news, which was dominating engagement, um, which at least to my mind is something of a heretical or challenging finding, because often in our experience when people are talking about social media, they are describing uh, the people, as the, the question which came up 10 minutes or so ago, the people who make the most noise, even though they're small in number, but actually, if you look at the whole census 
even though those people are making a lot of noise, it's not the most controversial subjects which are achieving the highest engagement, at least for BBC News articles. We also looked, when looking at topics, we, we went beyond the categorization news story by kind of uh, correspondent, but health correspondent or education correspondent, and did a thematic analysis to identify themes that people are interested interested in which cut across those existing categories. And those which seem to have the, the most interesting, the, the, the nine things which emerge from that analysis are, are these. Stories about human interest, about ordinary people doing unusual things, things about research and science, environment figured heavily, social issues, Brexit of course figured, UK and US relationship, which I think is allied to Brexit, um, international stories, other things in UK politics which aren't about Brexit, and company related news. So a really wide range of interests that our human coders have managed to isolate that people are serving by reading, sharing BBC news stories. So by this stage, we had a good idea of volume and we had a, a good picture of engagement. And there's of course a lot more to say about engagement in the full report. Um, we knew which things people are talking about, talking about and which topics are prominent. So this builds a certain kind of understanding, but it doesn't go as far as building an understanding of the audiences themselves. It's observational as much as it's explanatory. So in stage three, we went on to try and do exactly that, to build an understanding of the audiences themselves and to build profiles of users based on how they use BBC News content. And how we did it was, similarly as the times before, we cast the net across the whole globe. We looked at all of the news providers and we used both methods, keyword and URL linking. And then we also took 450 comments and our human analysts qualitatively coded them to give scale to the size of opinion groups, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Um, and this stage is a note, this qualitative analysis was solely based on publicly available Twitter data. So we just used Twitter data um, because it was the most appropriate data set to use at this stage. And then we went on to do a segment. So we built profiles. I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with segmentation, but let me just um, explain some of the technicalities of what a segmentation is and then come on and talk about the segment. So first, just as a note, about four fifths, 80% of people who share BBC News links don't actually say anything when they share them. They don't produce any content alongside the URL. So we know that they're sharing, but they're not really very helpful for understanding why people are sharing because they're not saying anything. So it would be too speculative to talk about why people are sharing. So we excluded those people. Once we'd excluded those people who are saying nothing when they're sharing and just focus on those who are commenting when they're sharing, we observe five different profiles. Um, and segmentation, just to explain really briefly what segmentation is, it, it's a conceptually simple thing where you take a, a whole group, everybody who's sharing BBC News articles in this instance, and you break that whole group down into subgroups where each of those subgroups has a particular quality or characteristic that all members of that group share, and that distinguishes that group from all of the other groups. Now you can do that segmentation in many, many different ways. You can look at these things demographically, for example. So you, you could build a group that says, people 60 to 70 who share BBC News are like this, people 20 to 30 who share BBC News are like this. Or very commonly in marketing, you might look at building attitudinal groups. So you might say, these people over here are, uh, have these attitudes to the BBC, which they share, they absolutely love the BBC. These people over here are pretty neutral about the BBC and you know, they, they share these kinds of attitudes that demonstrate their neutrality. And they're, they're all great and applicable in lots of ways. But what we always try to get to is what we call a needs-based segmentation. So by needs-based, what I mean is we are looking at the reasons why people are sharing content we're extrapolating those reasons from not just what they say, but also their wider context, because we've captured that full complexity. And then we're saying that because of um, you people share needs that you're fulfilling by sharing um, BBC News articles, and therefore you're a group and we can characterize your group by your needs. So to quickly run through each of these groups, there are seven. The first is the agreeables. Now, these are people who share non-controversial news articles. It's stuff that they think is cute, enchanting, uplifting, shocking, funny, factual, whatever it might be. They are using BBC News to 
present themselves as agreeable people. So they are serving the need in that way. The second group of venters, and they're very different, they very often sound frustrated and they very frequently vent their anger and they use sarcasm to express concern about whatever topical issues that they're sharing a BBC News story about. And often those things are about those concerns, they're about diversity, they're about multiculturalism, they might be about climate change and similar issues. So venters are using BBC News to, as the name suggests, vent their emotion and to demonstrate their strong feelings about the issues that I mentioned, things like diversity, multiculturalism and climate change. Thirdly, prototypers, they um, are using BBC News content to really back up their pre-existing agendas, what they already think, and they're using BBC News to show the world or their social network, whoever they might be demonstrating to, that, they understand, that, that the world supports their pre-existing view. The fourth is are the aggressive prototypers. Now, they're quite similar as you might expect to the to the third group but what differentiates them is that they're very emotionally charged when they're doing the things I just described they're they're generally speaking open about their mission they express a lot of frustration with the subject matter they're sharing um, particularly if that seems out of their reach for example climate change so they're typified by the degree of emotionality which they're using then the fifth group of the personalizers, and they're generally speaking sharing content because uh, to place themselves within the wider context that the BBC News article um, lays out. So they're contextualizing events happening around them and expressing their personal connectedness to the world using BBC News stories. Uh, then the sixth groups are the constructive critics. These are people who are sharing BBC content and they're highlighting minor errors, they're highlighting typos or inaccuracies in reporting, but they have a positive intention. They're highlighting it back to the provider and they're saying, in essence, please correct or reflect on this. And their intention is positive, even though they're criticizing. And then seventhly, a group which gets an awful lot of attention are the destructive critics of the BBC. They share BBC news content, but they fiercely voice their displeasure about it. Um, for these people, the BBC is not a reliable source, it's deeply biased and probably by intention, and they just very simply and often very vocally outright reject the validity of articles by labelling them with a lovely phrase, fake news. So there's a wide range of needs there, of segments defined by need, um, about why people are sharing BBC news stories. And for me at least, that underlines the challenge of the BBC addressing such a wide set of audiences. So then lastly, and I'm going to move through these quickly, the last, the last stage was about perceptions. So this is when we got a lot more specific. So instead of looking at everything across the world, we use just keyword searching, just in the UK, and just looking at BBC News. Um, so we, we did qualitative analysis on a subset, 720, 750, excuse me, comments off Twitter about sentiments towards BBC News. And again, solely based on Twitter data. Um, what that enabled us to do, among other things, is to plot these segments by perception and by engagement, which we established um, back near the beginning of the study, and to start to build some texture into how one might deal with or address these different segments. So one of these things which, um, uh, one of the phenomena which we observe when we do this, is if we plot them along those two metrics I just mentioned, we see that the vast majority are to some degree positive about the BBC, but a lot of those people who are positive, apart from the agreeables, are um, relatively unengaged. The group which is the most engaged, but the second smallest, because the size of the circle represents the size of the group, are these destructive critics. And for me, that begins to catalyze some of the challenges that the BBC faces. So just a couple of slides on perceptions in a bit more detail. So three more slides and then I'm going to conclude and, and, and come on to discussion and questions. Sorry, two more slides. I'm going to conclude and come on to discussion and questions. What we observed was that people out there in the, in the, in the social space are strongly expecting uh, that the public service represents their views. People are often critical of content that doesn't align with their own beliefs and values. 
So we're observing people in a well-established phenomenon, but we're observing people increasingly occupying these echo chambers, both online and in their social groups. So both online and offline, or indeed online and offline, if that makes sense. People who are in their offline social groups, where they're interacting online. We're also, we're also perceiving people seeking news that confirms their existing opinions and that reflects their existing views and perceptions. People are increasingly unfamiliar with having their ideas challenged. They're avoiding spaces and programmes, uh, pro as in programmes on the BBC, where that might happen. They're sort of self-censoring in that sense. Um, but having said that, it's quite clear that BBC performs an important public service through its reach, its broad acceptability, uh, broadly accepted strong reputation by most, not by everybody, but by most. It's trust trustworthy and high quality. Um, and engages with the people with a very wide range of views, even if at times these views are critical of the BBC itself. So then lastly, on, on sentiment towards the BBC. I mentioned earlier that we excluded from some of this analysis people who shared links without um, talking about the article themselves. But when we looked in a bit more detail at Twitter at those people, and express sentiment towards the BBC, around 80% of those people were negative. And only 5% of them were actually positive. So um, there's a lot of negative feeling out there. Um, and then lastly, criticism on social media of BBC News come from, a, from what we're saying is all sides of the political spectrum, but particularly from the extremities of the political spectrum. So it, it's quite fair to say that many feel that they're not politically represented by the public news service. Um, and people understand that the BBC's mission is that of a public service. Um, so we observe that uh, often for individuals, interpretation of public service really doesn't come down to some abstract sense of what public service is, but whether they personally feel their needs and interests are served. If what they're reading reflects their British identity, they can often be in support, and where it doesn't, they're often not. So criticisms are rooted in perceived contrasts between their opinions and those represented in BBC News. And where those things don't match, which of course necessarily considering the breadth of audiences which the BBC wants to address, when they don't match, for a lot of people, that's interpreted not just as something that they don't agree with, but as a failure to fulfil the public service duty. So a lot of the challenges there for the BBC. So I'm going to stop there. As, as I mentioned at the beginning, Ofcom's published the full study. It's on its website. There's a, there's a summary study as well, which goes in, even the summary goes in substantially more detail than we've had time to today. And we're going to share a link to that. Um, but to summarise why Sophie and I wanted to give this example today is to show that using TalkWalker's advanced tools and applying back in those approaches and principles to complexity is a really powerful way of building understanding cost effectively and rapidly. Um, it operates at scale. So we've been looking literally at centers of the conversation around the world in this study, but we still retain complexity and we get our human analysts to understand other humans rather than trying to use algorithms. So this gets us towards answers to the biggest questions, even when we don't really have hypotheses uh, that we can use to explore those questions. And I think we hope you agree. Okay, I'm going to stop there and open it up to the floor. Great. Thanks, James. Um, yeah, really interesting. And um, we have had a couple of other questions. The first one I think is really interesting, actually. Um, so they said, it seems that this type of analysis has a lot of benefits outside the world of brands and products. So this person's worked in urban planning and wondered if you'd utilise this type of research on understanding how people feel about what they value in their neighbourhoods, where they live in, that sort of thing. And I guess, are there any other examples outside the world of brands as well that you can give? Absolutely. Um, I completely agree with that view. It is broadly applicable across a wide range of topics. And, and really, it's not ever going to be sector specific. It's where it can be applied really is across sectors where people have really big questions where they're not sure what the answers are. So it's difficult to hypothesise. And where it's difficult to hypothesise, it's difficult to construct good questions and so on. So yeah, it's not sector specific. My job is a managing director of the of back of my public. So all of my clients are in the public realm in some way, their governments, their or their third sector organisations. 
And we've done a whole range of different studies. Uh, we've looked at, uh, for example, attitudes towards migration across the EU28 in all of the EU28 languages. Um, we've looked at the role of disinformation in the French presidential election in 2017. Um, so as, a, as an approach, it's highly malleable and applicable to uh, organisations with bottom lines, as in, uh, you know, who are uh, uh, profit focused and organisations which are also values focused. Um, on the point about urban planning, yeah, absolutely couldn't agree with you more. I think there's a huge amount of potential in that kind of work. We're currently in the early stages of working on a study about, um, uh, to give an example, in a US state on the eastern seaboard, which is like most US uh, states, highly polarised in terms of income between the urban areas and the suburban areas. And we're looking to contrast the experience of COVID among poor people in the state, mainly in the cities, and wealthy people in the suburbs. And the reason that we're doing that is because we're going to overlay those two sets of experiences, look at the differences, and look at how those experiences are either unique for poor people or um, particularly intense or different for poorer people in comparison to rich people. And we're going to build on the back of that policy advice. So we're going to be able to say, for this group, um, in this city, in these areas, with these particular issues, these are the policy interventions that you might want to consider, state level government or indeed federal government. So yeah, I think it's applicable across a whole range of areas. Um, and I guess there's a kind of follow on question in a way is, um, someone else has asked, can the same techniques be used for smaller brands or organizations, or is it only for kind of market leaders? So I guess that maybe refers to the amount of data that's publicly available. Mm, yeah, indeed. And so if I'm sure we have a comment on this, but to answer that directly, the only real limitation on utility, on, on what we can do is, if that conversation is happening on social media, if the thing that we're interested in examining is something that real people are talking about online, that's the limitation which we always bear in mind when we when we're talking with clients about you know the early stages of whether we can do something. If that conversation is going on online and we can identify the real language that people are using rather than our internal jargon that we used, then we can target, harvest, extract, interpret, understand. So that that's the limitation really. Um, and even I'd say with even smaller organisations who maybe don't have the footprint online that they might want, I think those organisations still have really big questions. So we might not be able to isolate down to brand A because brand A, there isn't enough conversation about brand A online. But what we can do is step back from any particular brand and look at the environment within which people negotiate the, the, the nature, quality and value of the, the family of brands. So we can still from the helicopter or even from the satellite get specific recommendations for brands which don't get a huge amount of conversation around them because we can understand the context within which people make choices about which brands they like and which they don't. Great. Um, there was one question earlier which um, I, given the time it came in you may have answered this in the presentation but I'll ask it anyway. Um, someone's asked what was the breakdown of conversations across the different channels and networks? Oh dear, good question. I don't have those details to hand actually. Um, I can share them with you, Sophie, and you could share them on. Okay. Um, it's, I mean, as, as a generality, it's really variable. Um, and I think one of the strengths of one of the reasons we like working with Talkwalker is because we're able to look across all of those social networks where conversations are happening. So when we talk about social networks, it's natural, isn't it, to come to the ones which are most prominent. We talk about Twitter, we think about Facebook, we talk about Instagram, TikTok these days, and so on. But actually, an awful lot of social conversation online takes place in less prominent forums. So uh, one of the really rich sources which we're always mining is um, comment sections associated with local or regional press. So we're going below the line and we're extracting comments from people talking about particular articles. Um, we're going to, uh, you know, networks like Nextdoor, for example, and um, we're extracting local conversation there. I don't know if you know Nextdoor, but it, it's one of the more communitarian social networks. 
um, or we're doing things like going to local area forums. So I, I live in North London. Um, there's a, a Queen's Crescent Community Association. There's a lot of conversation about Queen's Crescent Community Association online. So we can go into those forums and we can extract sort of that very local conversation. So the general answer is in all of our projects, because TalkWalk enables us to do this, we pretty much look across the full range of, um, of conversations uh, across the full range of social media. There's a huge amount of variation in where conversations take place. Great, well, um, I don't think there's any more questions and we're almost um, at time actually. So I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there, but um, thank you so much, James, for, for your insights and for sharing this case study. Um, really interesting and, and I imagine people will be interested to see the full study. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll share the, the slides um, in the next day or so with you via email um, and any, any, any useful links as well. Great, well, uh, thanks for joining everyone and um, hopefully meet you again at another one in the future. Thank you everybody. Thank you, Sophie.